Welcome everybody to episode 4 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast presented by Exomon Gear. First things first, I gotta take care of something that I forgot on the last episode, and that's giving away some swag. So Ashley Oshner, Aaron Christensen, you guys are this week's winners. Ashley sent us a great email to podcast at exomountaingear.com and gave us a gear tip, which you'll hear about in a little bit. Aaron Christensen left, left us a review on iTunes. We really appreciate it both. So if you guys, listeners, you want to be eligible for giveaways for Exo Mountain Gear swag, be sure to send us some feedback or leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening to this podcast. So tonight in episode four, it's an episode all about gear. Myself, Mark Hilzing, I'm joined by Steve Speck and Lenny Nelson. We discuss pretty much everything that we take with us on backcountry hunts, starting with our backpack, talking about the big gear like tents and sleeping pads, sleeping bags, all the way down to the little nitty gritty like first aid and water filters. Pretty much A to Z, we cover it all. And we all have different approaches. So it's kind of a cool way to hear about some gear differences, some weight differences, and philosophy differences. No matter where you land in the spectrum, I think you'll find this episode helpful. Enjoy it, and be sure to tune back in next time. All right, well, Steve, Lenny, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot. Good to be on here. Yeah, tonight's going to be a, a fun episode as we kind of, uh, kind of dive deep into our gear um, and the things we're using from big to small, you know, the feedback's been great on the podcast so far. We appreciate all the emails and questions and comments and reviews. Obviously, a lot of those questions have been gear related. So tonight's an an awesome opportunity for the three of us to kind of go through what we use. So we're just kind of start looking at our gear list and go top to bottom and and start discussing things. So Steve, what's number one for you? Uh, Well, you know, probably the number one is obviously the pack that you that you're putting all of your gear inside. So, um, obviously a little biased here, <laughs> but I'll, I'll be using the, the XO 3500. Um, I'll run one hip belt pouch on the right side, which I interchange with either my, uh, camera or my range finder, depending on if I'm cameraman or hunter and a meat shelf. And then our slurpee stalker with removable shoulder harness for, um, for the first 10 days of deer hunting. Um, so that'll be my pack setup. So why is the other side of the hip belt empty? Just because you don't need to run a pocket there? Yeah, just to have it. I guess I could, yeah, I just don't need to run a pocket there. Yeah. Um, I think uh, just interest of saving, you know, three ounces or whatever that weighs. It's not much, but um, yeah. Yeah, cool. How's your, how's your setup, Lenny? You're using the 35 as well, right? Yeah, I'm using the 35 as well. Um, and honestly, it's set up almost exactly the same. Uh, I also use uh, one hip belt pouch for, you know, my my calls, my rangefinder, camera. Um, and I also use the meat shelf in, in mine with a, and then with mule deer hunting, the slurpee stalker with the shoulder harness has been, been awesome. Yeah. So do you guys have that slurpee stalker kind of clipped into those, uh, top attachment points, but then you can yank it out quick when you need to, is that how you're running it? Exactly. Pretty much. You don't even know the harness is there. It just kind of sits in the bottom of the bag. And then when you need it, just unclip the, the two quick cl- clips inside the bag and, clip them onto the harness and and you're off yeah that's cool well my setup's pretty similar as well but i'm left-handed so my hip belt pouch is on the other side (laughs) (laughs) i'm usually running uh, a bear spray or something on the other side just you know maybe i'm the chicken but to warn off those nasty creatures out there in the wilderness so Mm -hmm. yeah we'll probably when we go to alaska we'll probably be packing some pistols yeah and bear spray yeah yeah, yeah. Spray. that's actually what we did last year is my buddy had bear spray and i had a pistol so a little a mm-hmm. little bit of both okay yeah so uh really i think next up the major item for me is the tent um this year i'll be using a uh um two different tents probably depending on the weather i'm trying um we have an exo customer jim dean he he runs um he basically makes these kind of tarps and lightweight bivvies out of his house and uh so he calls them jimmy's tarps and uh, the whole tarp and baby sack weighs uh, right at 16 ounces, one pound even for wow. a tarp baby sack. Uh, so you got a few ounces in steaks. And then, uh, you know, since last year I started packing a trekking pole, which that's kind of the main reason I started looking at using a trekking pole style tent. It was like if I'm going to be packing it, I might as well 
you know, like a lot of other things, Tool utilize use. this so it has yeah two or three uses. Um, so the thing's one pound. I'm excited to use it. Uh, I've always been hesitant of floorless shelters. I don't know why. I don't know if it's a security comfort thing or I'm just afraid of getting stuck in bad weather. Um, so we'll see. I'm excited to, I'll be using it this weekend, scouting for mule deer and um, kind of check it out now through, I'm sure I'll, I plan to use it the first 10 days of season and see how I think, see what I think about it. Yeah. And so then that, I've got, oh, go ahead. Is that a sill nylon, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. It's a super lightweight sill nylon. Yep. Yeah. And then he, he, um, uh, he just uses like that sill, sill net coating stuff that you paint on there for the seams. And, right. Um, I set it up in the backyard and, um, right in the middle of the yard where the sprinklers were hitting it really well and it, <laughs> it stayed pretty dry. So I was, I was actually pretty impressed with that. Yeah. That's awesome. But, um, it's, it's more, you're definitely more exposed to the elements and, um, you know, good or bad. If you're in a really bad storm, it might not be that fun, but if it's nice weather. You're kind of half sleeping out under the stars, which would be cool. Yeah. So, um, and then I'll have the a Hilleberg, the, their Enan tent, which is new this year, super lightweight, one man tent. Lenny, Lenny actually borrowed that on our last scouting trip. What do you think of that, Lenny? Uh, the setup on it was awesome. Um, you know, because for me, uh, it's got to be easy to set up, and that was really nice about it. Uh, definitely condensation was a little. I mean, it's a really warm tent, and it was a warm night, so condensation was was a, a little heavy. But besides that, it's going to be a nice. Like easy to set up tent. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking in a nasty weather, that thing's going to be pretty awesome. Oh yeah, yeah bomb proof. So is that kind of where those single like um, rainbow style hub poles that goes across the top, like a mm-hmm. loop yeah. pole? Yeah, yep. yeah. It's got one center pole, and then it's it's so it's non freestanding. You got to pitch out both ends, and and a lot of people, myself included, Lenny probably included, you know, for years we used I ha- had to have a freestanding tent, just thinking that. A non-free stand is going to be a pain in the butt, but ever since like that Hilleberg and Hand, I started using that two-man. Lenny and I will share that every once in a while. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's been a non-issue. If if we, if it's loose soil, you find a heavy rock or a tree or a bush, or it's always been not an issue at all. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's maybe nice if you set it up and you need to move it, but in yeah. general, it's you know you can get it set up even if it's not freestanding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm going back to floorless this year. Uh, that's what I used a couple of years ago and really enjoyed it. Last year, just wanted to, you know, I'm always kind of trying something new and looking for the new great thing. Um, but we're using a Seek Outside Simmer on this year. So it's a um, two to four man, um, you know, floorless shelter. Um, it's kind of built for two and a stove if you need to. If you're not running a stove, you could get three, four guys in there. It's trekking pole supported. So um, I'm interested to see what you think of floorless, Steve, once once you actually yeah. get to using it. But yeah. I actually really like it. Um, and you can vary the pitch. You can vary, you know, the airflow. Um, and I think as long as you're smart about where you set it up, um, you know, water and those things are really, really not an issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the, the, I guess the one thing I get hung up on is just sometimes we don't have a choice. Yeah. Where you set it up. I mean, I, I can't think of how many times we've dug out deer beds big enough to put our tent. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm yeah. a little bit of worried about that with the Jimmy's tarp because you, you, it has a pretty big footprint. So we'll Yeah, see. they tend to. I mean, you know, they tend to go a little bit wider um, yeah. and, and definitely take up some more floor space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So speaking of which, Lenny, you've been using the, the Golight TP, what, for two, three years now? Shoot, at least three, maybe four years now. Yeah, okay. the the Shangri La three uh, started off taking it with the the nest inside and the fly or and the pole, and then kind of like everyone just seemed like over time you kind of progress. And pretty soon I left the the nest at home, and then now I'm leaving the pole at home, and I just pull off uh, one of my spotting scope uh, legs. And, your, tri- uh, your tripod legs, or yeah, yeah, <laughs> excuse me, yeah, my tripod leg, and uh, shove that up and use that for the pole in the middle. And, uh, it's, it's big. It's, you know, Steve's definitely more the ounce counter and I, I kind of go a little bit more for comfort and durability and ease of use. Those are kind of, I'm with I you. Mean, it's still gotta be, <laughs> it's still gotta be light, but, um, you know, not to the, to the extent that, uh, it's not comfortable and durable cause I'm hard on my gear. Yeah. <laughs> That's an <laughs> understatement. <laughs> we call yeah. any of the destroyer. <laughs> yeah. I've seen some of your damage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's it's uh, easy to set up. Probably the only downside to it 
is um, it has a really big footprint. I mean, really big. So yeah. mule deer hunting, uh, it, it's a little hard because you don't want to come off the top of the mountain to find a place to set up your tent, and and you kind of got to be. It's it's definitely tough. Yeah, because yeah, that's we the that. that's so the we, circular style like true TP uh, design, right? On that yep, one, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I was gonna say we used that tent a few times last year, but it was in country where we knew. You know, like that, what, last week in elk season, we knew, like, all right, we just got to go to the top over here, hike half a mile, and there's a big, giant flat spot where we would have pitched that sucker. Mm-hmm. But if we were a new country, that would have been, you know, that would have been interesting. Yeah. And, and and we were in really bad weather that weekend. I mean, it rained yeah. all night hard, and, man, that, that thing held up really good. Mm-hmm. Little condensation. They're, it's pretty warm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, back when they were selling them, it, it's really cost-effective. I think it was only 200 and. 80 bucks or something yeah Yeah. that's what i'm gonna say it's a pretty good decent budget option for sure yeah Mm -hmm. all right so let's talk about what's going in those tents what's the sleeping (laughs) setup for you guys and your Um, dogs so yeah yeah sorry for the background noise my wife kicked me out of the house because she was rocking music cleaning so i had to and the dog (laughs) yeah Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Yeah, we both were sitting on the back patio and there's dogs barking in the background uh so steve's gear testing in the backyard tonight his wife kicked him out yeah. <laughs> so uh Thermarest NeoAir is my sleeping pad. I've been using been using that for five years now probably. Um I had one for three seasons. Um uh, like the original one and then I, I finally got a leak in it that I could never figure out and I sent it back to Thermarest and they replaced it with their newer X Lite model. Um I absolutely love that pad. It's twelve ounces. Um it's twenty by seventy two, two and a half inches thick. Great R value. I mean, it's got like a sticky surface on top, so you don't slide off it all night long. I, I just, I don't know. I can't say enough good things about that pad. So I do baby it. You know, I, I spend that extra five minutes picking up pine needles and stuff like that. That you know, the underneath your floor, of your tent before I pitch the tent. Um, so I've, I've never really had too many issues with leaks or anything. And I just, yeah, I love that. Yeah. How about you, Lenny? Uh, I use a three-quarter length ProLite. It's kind of like the original Thermarest. I've had it forever, honestly. Um, I've used a few other pads, but it's kind of low profile, and honestly, it's bomb-proof. I've probably had it for eight, nine years, and I've never had a leak. Wow. Uh, and and I literally, like, even with my floorless, I roll it out. I don't even care what's underneath me. Throw it down, and it holds up. So that kind of – it's 16 ounces, and it's only three-quarter length, so it's not great. But yeah. it's tough. That's pretty good to stand up to the destroyer for that many years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, a sleeping bed for me is one of those items where I'm not super crazy lightweight just because I love to sleep. So I use a Big Agnes, uh, their insulated Q-Core, which is mm-hmm. big and plush. And I'm a fairly tall dude and I like full length. So it's definitely a place where I could shave weight. But at the same time... I just really love to sleep. So it's so plush, the the it's warm. Is that the one with the quilt kind of on it? Yeah, and they actually have a lighter version now. So they have like the insulated Q-Core SL, I think, for super yep. light now. Yep. Um, and, you know, so mine's, again, mine's like probably four years old and still going strong. And I've never just, you know, it's one of those places where you can spend some dough and save a few ounces, but I just haven't got around to it because it's working. So Nice. And how much is that way? Uh, I believe mine, and I think I even have the long one, is like 25 ounces. So it's okay. not, you know, super light by any means, but I sleep pretty dang well. well can't argue with that. Yeah. Yep. What about yeah. bags for you guys? Um, I'm, I, Last year, I started using a quilt from a company called Hammock Gear, and absolutely love that. Um, it's great for... It's a 30 degree quilt and it, and really 30 is as cold as I want to go in it but you know that's going to take me through most of September. Yeah. And then if I get into October, November, I have my mountain hardware. Uh it's a Phantom 32 degree bag and I can put a I have a Sea to Summit reactor liner I can put in that and take it down into the low teens and still sleep well, you know, sleeping in my puffy jacket. Is that a um silk liner? What material is that? Uh no, it's like a fleecy Oh, it's okay. got like it's a real thin fleece liner, and it really does. When I mean, they say it adds ten, fifteen degrees to your bag, and in my experience, that's about spot on. So, wow. 
Um, but yeah, that quilt, I mean, it's 14 ounces. Wow. Uh, so it's just incredibly light and you know, they're based there. There's no zipper. They stop at your neck, you know, so your head sticks out, but I just take my like, uh, first light trauma hoodie and put sleep with the hood on or sleep with my puffy jacket hood on, uh, if it's going to be really cold. So my head doesn't get cold and, um, based off the premise that you're compressing all the insulation underneath you anyway. So what's the point of paying for the weight of it? Right. Um, cause there's no value there, our value. Um, and I definitely find it to be pretty true. So I, I've really been toying around the idea of getting like a, a 15 or a 20 degree quilt made that would probably be like low 20 ounces. And then, man, that would probably have me set for anything I encounter, you know, outside of like backpacking in January for hunting wolves or something like that. Yeah. So I guess that compresses pretty small as well. And are you running down in that or synthetic? Yeah, it's like an 850 fill down. 850. So every everything we use is down, yeah. um, for sure. How about you, Lenny? Uh, again, I'm I'm look, probably a little old school here. I have like a two and a half pound. Uh, it was a Moonstone. They actually went out of business. I probably had it for ten plus years. Uh, it's a 15 or 20 degree bag. And honestly, I'm just I'm never willing to be cold. So I pack that in the summer whenever. I'd much rather be hot than cold. So yeah, um, I definitely have a little comfort there too. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same way. I have a uh, Sierra Designs Zisu 12. I uh, I don't like to be cold, and I do kind of camp year round. So I was like, man, I'm just gonna go for one bomber bag that'll kind of go through anything. And I have had it down in the teens, and it works uh, incredibly well. So. It's a down bag as well. I think it is 850, and then it's also their treated down, so it has the um, you know that mm. water resistance to it. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. It's like 36, 38 ounces somewhere on there, and that's an again in a long because I'm like six three. Um, mm-hmm. But it's just it's awesome. It's an awesome mm. bag, and actually the on the um, on the budget side of things, you know Sierra Designs and Kelty are basically the same parent company. And Kelty has um, some really similar stuff, I think, in, you know, the lower down ratings that aren't quite as efficient as 850, but mm-hmm. that same um, water resistant down in that that are actually pretty dang good deals. Hmm. Yeah, I've been, that, that water resistant down stuff, it really intrigues me. I would definitely like to check that out. Not that I don't think I've ever once had an issue where my down bag got soaking wet and I was been screwed, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be nice to have if that ever did happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, mine's never got soaked, but I've been in some, like, cramped tents um, where some condensation issues, and, you know, my foot end got quite wet. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. probably minor, but at the same time, I didn't really have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. So. Huh. Nice. Um, next on my list here in front of me is, is the stove, uh, and we're probably all in the exact same boat running the jet boil. Run it while you can, right? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Since they stopped making the Soul model, which I cannot fathom why they did that. But, um, yeah, can't say enough good things. Lenny's the one that had the original Jet Boil and got me hooked on it. And, oh, man, you'd have to pry that thing out of my cold, dead hands. Yeah, Yeah, I I completely agree. I mean, man, nothing else that it's quick, it's easy, it's reliable. It just doesn't get any better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had somebody just ask in uh, this week about fuel canisters, too. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that I love about the jet boil is, you know, it's a great form factor and it all, you know, contains within itself and that's all great. But mm-hmm. it's just so efficient. I mean, it, you know, I can pack for a week and obviously you got to look at how much you're going to use it, what are the weather, you know, what's the weather like, what elevation you're going to be at. But for me in September at, you know, 10,000 feet, I can pretty much run a week on the little mini canister um, for what I need and be fine. And so that's pretty awesome to be able to go out for six, seven days and only need that one canister. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. There's Agree. no other, no other thing that I'm aware of that is that fuel efficient. Cool. So uh, what about, what about other yeah. little uh, cooking type gear? Yeah. I said, I, I have a, I actually use a jet boil fork. It's like this um, kind of telescopes, you know, yeah. And um, it just collapses in half, and like the the fork end just slides inside the handle end, and weighs like half an ounce. It's made out of plastic. Works fantastic. I've never really got the spending forty dollars on a titanium fork because it's just <laughs> like they they weigh the exact amount and cost you know it's like five dollars versus forty bucks. So I've been yeah. using that for quite a while, and then I even have a 
Oh, probably what, 10 years ago I, at REI, I bought like four or five plastic forks that, you know, maybe they weigh an ounce or something, but of all the areas to spend money, it just, you know, that seems like an area you can just save it. Yeah, yeah even those. Yeah, go ahead, Lenny. Oh, I was going to say, I agree. I still use a REI plastic spork. I mean, it, you can't break them. They're inexpensive and they weigh nothing. Yeah, I think those are the Lexan ones and they're dirt cheap and yeah, they're pretty dang tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I actually do have a titanium one that was a gift and it's the, um, it's the light, my fire spork, but it's not like a spoon and fork in the one end. It's actually one ends a spoon, one ends a fork. And then oh, really? the edge huh. of the fork is kind of serrated. Mm-hmm. Um, they have the plastic ones, which are like two bucks. And I used to use those all the time, like even at work. Um, and I did break them eventually. And so my wife got sick of me breaking them and she bought me the titanium one. Oh, uh, nice. It's like 12 bucks though. So, you know, oh, it's not, not like the crazy $40 thing. So that's crazy cheap for a titanium one. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's like half ounce and it's actually more functional than most sporks just because the, the way that it's designed. So it's pretty decent. Mm-hmm. The only thing I don't like is it, you know, it doesn't uh, fold. So it's not going to fit in your jet boil or anything, but, ah. mm. yeah. but it works. Cool. Uh, next on my list is water filter. Um, and I believe, uh, Mark, you're using the Sawyer as well or no? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've had, um, a platypus gravity, uh, gravity system. Uh-huh. Um, and then I'm running that same system now with the Sawyer mini, um, in okay. line with it. And so, uh-huh. yeah, I mean, there's a couple of reasons I do the gravity system. Um, and one of the main reasons is, you know, unlike you guys, we tend to set up a, a, a backcountry base camp that we're coming back to each night. Um, and so one thing I love about the gravity system is being able to grab, you know, a decent chunk of dirty water, um, whether it's at camp or on the way back to camp. And then just, we have it that whole night, the whole next morning. And then with the gravity system, what I do is I just hang that dirty bag, um, I have my Sawyer Mini running in line, and then the clean line coming out of the other side of the Mini has a clamp on it. And so literally with my dirty bag hanging in the tree, I can unclamp it. It just starts filtering and running. So it's almost like we have a little bit of running water to you mm-hmm. know do dishes, fill drinks, fill the jet boil, et cetera. And then at the same time, um, you know, before we head out the next day or what have you, I'll just hook my clean bladder, my drinking tube bladder that I, that I have in my pack up to that same gravity system. Um, and then just fill it up and I'm, I'm pretty much set for the day. So mm. yeah, I run sort of a, a dirty bladder, um, the Sawyer mini in line. And then I obviously have a clean bladder that, you know, I have my drinking mm-hmm. tube hooked up to for the day. Right. Nice. Yeah. We, how long have we been using the Sawyer? Let me, third, this would be third the fourth, year. This would be the fourth year. Or third. I think so. Something like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think you took me about a year to get on board. I was a little skeptical at first. Yeah. yeah I mean, it took, I remember first seeing it and I was skeptical and I waited it's a year tiny. to try it. It's it's tiny. It weighs nothing. It's cheap. It's kind of yeah. like, you know, you're just used to backpacking. If it's going to be nice, you're supposed to pay a lot of money for it. And the Sawyer is just, it's like the complete opposite of the, all the rules that you're supposed to, you know, follow. Um, but it's, you know, they're, they're like 30 bucks 40 bucks they weigh three ounces you you know it ties in perfectly when we're hunting mule deer because just like you with your gravity filter we have a dirty bag that we can fill up for extra water um and we buy platypus two liter they're called platy bottles Mm -hmm. um fill those up you know and then we all have three three liter bladders that we run in our pack so we can run at any time five liters of water um and sometimes you you need i know our some of our mule deer spots once you get up on top of the ridge and, and you got to drop, you know, two, 3000 feet to get to water and you don't have to do that every day. So, yeah. um, it's efficient. You can set it up to gravity flow. You can squeeze it even, you know, if I'm elk hunting, it's so efficient. You know, some of our favorite spots where we know there's water sources every, you know, half mile, mile, whatever. Um, you know, I just run like bare minimum water in the pack and, Felt you know, if we're, fill it when i need it or you know maybe you're running low and you got a bull bugling you cross the stream you take 30 seconds fill up that dirty bag throw it in your pack and filter the water later yeah um, i mean it just it beats the hell out of you know i was running an msr hyperflow for a long time before that i caded in um 
and you know you just gotta sit there and freaking pump for five ten minutes and your forearms burning and you gotta yeah. you had to pull your bladder out of the pack to get to it that's the other thing about the sawyers make sure if you use it you get that fast fill adapter so all you all you're doing is cutting your bladder tube right right i cut mine right where it comes out of the pack and it has this little quick connect thing you just connect it right in and you're filtering right into your bladder and your pack uh, yeah. it just doesn't get any more efficient than that so yeah and the other thing i mean those pumps obviously you have the uh the time and the effort you take to pump water and then obviously they're heavier and more expensive but then you have some field maintenance issues and stuff like that and with mm-hmm. you know the sawyer inlines you know you just pretty much back flush them and you're good to go yep yeah, so, just back flush it every time you get home from a trip, and it'll last you five years without even blinking. Yeah. So, I mean, the one caveat or warning yeah, you throw out for guys on that is to uh, try not to let it freeze. Um, yes. You know, with those hollow fibers, um, if they freeze with moisture in there, which is obviously probably going to happen if it freezes in the field that there is moisture in there, um, those tubes that actually do the filtering at that micro level, they can crack and expand. And so that would actually let some of the nasties through. Um, so do you guys do anything special? I mean, sometimes if I know it's going to be well below freezing, I'll just throw it in my sleeping bag with me or something to that effect. Yeah. Um, Lenny, what do you do? I, I just drink the water. You just drink <laughs> yeah. the water. No, yeah. Was... <laughs> uh... Yeah, I don't know. I, like I said, I've got a heart on my gear. I just, yeah, I, I, I just change out the filter. They're, they're kind of so, in, so inexpensive annually, and I haven't had any issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well we, we always shake out. Like if we, right when we filter, you just freaking give that thing like three or four shakes, you know, and get the last little bit of water out of there. Um, so mm-hmm. that there's not a bunch of water sitting in the filter, which if you're leaving it at camp doing a gravity flow thing, that's a different issue. Right. Um, but uh, so you would want to definitely take it out. And if there's water inside of it, bring your sleeping bag. But we just make sure we get the water out of it. And, and you know, there might be a little bit left in there, but it's not going to be enough to freeze and expand the those little hollow tubes. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, if it's going to be crazy cold, you know, in the teens, I'll put it inside the tent with me neck right next to my sleeping pad or something. Yeah. So this isn't a gear question, but we're talking about water. Just curious. Do you guys use um, any sort of, you know, additive supplements, electrolytes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to add to the water while you're in the field? Just either we for flavor it. or for nutritional? I, I have it on a consistent basis. Yeah. Yeah. I When I've, first started backpacking i always used to take um i got like those little hawaiian punch packets you know the kind of little skinny packet and i and then i take a little bottle a water bottle with me and mix that in for eating dinner just so i just to drink something different than water yeah um and then somewhere along the line i stopped doing that and uh every once in a while like lenny there's one year you kind of pack some wilderness athlete stuff Mm -hmm. for a little bit um and then, I don't know, the last two, three years, nothing really. We do always take, like, you know, we are out of coffee, obviously, and uh, yeah. to kind of mix it up. And then Jason introduced um, chai tea a couple of years ago. That's been the new, like, the, the, <laughs> the deli- evening drink. <laughs> yeah, the evening delicacy. Nice. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we always, I always bump. Is that like Madagascar those. vanilla in that, too? And yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, it's a big package, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But they're, you know, sometimes it's, I will say that because, you know, it is uncomfortable when you're back there and uh, some of those little things, just like sitting there drinking coffee for me or that chai tea, you know, it just kind of makes you feel, I don't know, really, you're relaxed, makes you feel at home. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, That's cool. Yeah. I use, How about you? Uh, yeah, I use some stuff. I don't know if it's called Noon or None, but it's N-U-U-N. Um, okay. And they're little tablets that you drop in. So you don't have to mess with powders and things like that. And they come in awesome, uh, little lightweight sort of canister package. Um, so yeah, you can just drop a tablet in and it lightly carbonates the water and has a kind of a light clean flavor, but then it has some like, you know, electrolytes and things like that. So it's partly for something different and then partly Hmm. just to, to boost up those electrolytes. But yeah, I mean, when I'm out there, nothing, you know, too sweet or strong usually sounds good. So this stuff kind of hits the right spot. Nice. Yeah, check that out. Yeah. 
So I have been packing the wilderness athlete like energy and focus. Um, I use that stuff a lot mountain biking and, and I really, really like it and I'll probably pack it. Um, you know, throw a few in my pack this year. We used a ton of them on the, on our death hike that we did there a few weeks ago. And I actually think that really helps you get through a trip like that. Yeah. I'm digging yeah. some of the new flavors they have too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's unique to me because it doesn't get that kind of, that sugar kind of dry mouth. Like I, like I get with Gatorade. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, that's what I like about it. Cool. What's up next uh, on your list, Steve? Uh, next on the list is my headlamp. Um, I have two, a Princeton Tech Remix that I've been using for a long time. And then last year, I bought a Black Diamond Spot. Uh-huh. I'm going to have to look that up and just double check. That's the model. Um, <laughs> I, think you, I think you just wanted to be like me on that. That's what I'm running. Yeah. Um, in that spot, I got it, and I'm just like a typical man or whatever. I just threw the directions in the trash, and then I got so frustrated with it because uh, there's like you literally got to hold, you know, like hold the one button down for six seconds to lock it and double tap it to do this and hold hilarious. for three seconds to do that, you know, and I couldn't figure it out. You know, Normally, I'm just like you should just be able to just push the buttons and kind of figure it out in a few seconds, and so yeah. I freaking just set the thing in my closet and never touched it, and then – couple weeks ago i was backpacking with uh jason and my wife and his girlfriend and i had one and she showed me how to use it i was like son of a <laughs> so <I was> like, <laughs> that thing is pretty sweet you know because you can you know having your headlamp come on when it's in your pack because it gets bumped it's kind of a pain in the butt and you can hold if you hold the button down for six seconds like when it's off it'll a little blue light will flash and it yeah. reads that it's locked and you, it won't turn on unless you hold the button for six seconds again so pretty cool uh pretty cool headlamp i think it's if you look at all the ratings for like the price the size the weight uh the battery life and the lumens that it throws out it ranks really really high at the, at the, on top of all that so um i've been pretty impressed with it so far on used it a lot there on the death hike that we did and then um and then two other scouting trips since then so yeah yeah that i've been running one of those for a couple of years and then even the version before that from black diamond um i've been so i've been running those for probably five six years and they are awesome the mm-hmm. spot it does it has probably like four or five different functions but the thing is mm-hmm. like you said steve there's only one button so you kind of have to like you know you got to know when to hold it when to press it when to double click it yeah uh, things like that but once you get it down it is a wicked little headlamp yeah i was super impressed yeah. So, Lenny, you're running the same version, but the Revolt, right? The rechargeable? Yeah. Yeah, so again, my uh, ease of use, uh, kind of what I like to do. Uh, first time we used it on the death hike, uh, plugged it in, charged it, and, man, it held its charge really, really well. Because um, it always seems like the, the problem with these LEDs is you use them and they go down so slowly that by the time you realize that they're dead, it's like you can see like a foot in front of you. Right. Um, and so yeah. I'm excited about being able to plug this in every time and kind of have that, that like that new battery feel. Yeah. The full yeah. power. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, next sc- scrolling on down the list is uh camera, um, uh, my extra batteries and extra SD cards. So, camera um you know obviously we do a lot of filming uh, i have the sony rx 103 lenny actually just bought one here this year too because it was kind of everyone was so impressed with the the one i bought last year awesome mm-hmm. pull and shoot camera amazing picture quality amazing vic- video quality really good audio for a point and shoot um it, it is an 800 dollars camera but uh the, the pictures rival dslr quality um all day long frankly i've done quite a few head-to-head tests and i've been blown away with it so yeah. great great camera and you know for the average guy 800 dollars is a lot to spend if you're not filming your hunts but you know photos are a big part of you know looking back on stuff and, and having really high quality images you know is, is pretty important to have yeah for sure well how, how about you mark what do you pack for a camera um, I'm actually trying something new this year. Um, I've been testing a camera from Olympus, uh, something they sent me to check out. Um, and it's from their, I don't know if they call it like their tough series or whatever, but it's one of those cameras that's, uh, fully sealed. It's fully waterproof, shockproof, dustproof, etc. Uh-huh. Um, and so anytime you have that, I think you're gonna, you're gonna give up, you know, somewhere. Um, so mm-hmm. obviously, you know, it's like a probably 300, 20 ish dollar camera so it's not going to okay. shoot like an 800 dollar camera but 
I have been impressed for like what it is for the size and the weight, all the features. Um, man, it's a, it's a sick little camera. So if you're one of those guys that's not, you know, like necessarily wants to worry about their gear, um, Lenny, if you weren't such a photo freak, this would be a great camera for you because you can't <laughs> break it. Um, but yeah, like it's impressive. I mean, we were, you know, I've used it underwater a bunch. We were on a float a few weeks ago where I was like in the river for three or four hours and just, you know, had it in my shorts and you know, it's just cool. And wow. uh, it takes pretty good pictures. It has uh Bluetooth and then it has like an app. Um, so like Olympus has an app for your phone. So if you're out in the field um, and want to, for example, uh, you know, get a photo from the camera to your phone and then like post it online or something, you just wireless transfer the photos from the camera straight to your phone. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's pretty slick. Um, and I, I misspoke. It's not Bluetooth. It's actually Wi-Fi. So the camera itself creates its own little Wi-Fi network that your phone connects to. So no wow. kidding. yeah. And it has, uh, yeah, it has like panoramic modes and then the built-in lens itself is, uh, um, a really wide angle. I forget the number on it, but definitely wider than most. So for like your landscape and like a lot of cool hunting shots, it's actually a slick little camera. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to, uh, get it out in the field further this fall. Nice. Yeah. I look forward to seeing that. Yeah. Um, let's see. So the next, uh, kind of skipping past clothes we'll hit that here in the end um my first aid kit is very very basic i think i have like a adventure medical kit ultra light that i converted into my own version of it um and so inside that i have some spare iodine tablets if worse comes to worse a lighter I usually wrap wrap that lighter with some uh gorilla tape to have that as backup proof matches in there just a little tiny case of it um, I always do every year get some steel, some cotton balls and Vaseline and from the wife's part of the bathroom and get, <laughs> you know, get a few of those, uh, um, rocking and rolling. That's the best fire starter I've ever found. Yeah. That's um, phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Tylenol PM. That is the secret to a happy life in the back country. <laughs> it's the only way any of us, you know, my, I'm terrible. If I don't take time on PM, I take two or three every time at night. And if I don't take them, I, I don't sleep. So, um, ibuprofen, you know, I'll just, I just kind of refill that every couple of weeks during hunting season. Uh, just a few bandages. I really, maybe like I have four or five in there, uh, a little piece of gauze, Definitely have uh, some extra AAA batteries for the headlamp. And then I have these little uh, Cabela's branded um, LED hat clip lights. They weigh absolutely nothing. And, man, I can't tell you how many times. I don't think I've ever had to use it as a backup, but I've had to loan it out to Jason or Lenny because they forgot their headlamps. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we've, uh, that thing definitely comes in handy. And they weigh, they can't weigh half an ounce. And, they run off like a clock watch style battery and they're pretty solid. So, yeah. How about you guys? First aid. Mine's pretty minimal. Mine's pretty much a lighter duct tape, the Vaseline cotton balls and some ibuprofen and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of yeah. did the same thing as you, Steve. I think I grabbed uh, one of those adventure medical kits. They have like the ultralight series. It kind of is nice because it has a little waterproof bag and that. Um, I think it's a good way to get started, but yeah, there's certainly, I think more than, uh, most folks will probably need, even though in those ultralight kits. So I kind of did the same and just took it apart, um, and then added what I needed. Um, you know, things like, uh, the Bic mini lighter, um, going back to that, those drinks that noon or none, however you say it in the canister, Mm -hmm. they come in. Um, that's actually a perfect little storage canister because it seals up waterproof. So I can actually fit like a Bic Mini and three or four uh, fire starters in one of those. Oh, nice. So I repurpose yeah. those. Um, so that's kind of a slick little way to do it. Um, tenacious Tape. I think that company is called Gear Aid. Um, and they have this stuff called ten- Tenacious Tape. So it's kind of like a, a grill tape or, you know, better than a duct tape for sure on steroids. Um, that stuff's just bomb proof. So. That's kind of the, one of the little maybe different things worth checking out is that tenacious tape because it's really good huh. stuff. Yeah. Huh. Where do you buy that? I think you can pick it up at REI and all that. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the company is called Gear Aid. Um, 
and it's just bomber bomber stuff for sure they even they sell all kinds of stuff i mean they sell patches um they sell gore-tex patches for repairing rain gear if guys are interested in that and and fleecy tech patches for uh you know repairing clothing but that tenacious tape i mean i've known guys that have like sealed their air pads with it and like you know pretty heavy duty stuff wow yeah wow. oh cool um next on the list is my kill kit which basically is game bags knife and parachute cord so um i i carry about 25 feet of like this ultralight dyneema cord it's um just a super super light stuff weighs like half an ounce um for my knife i use a it's a super ultra light kind of skeleton knife by a company out of Kest- uh, named Kestrel. They're out of California, and they use uh, they make that knife out of S thirty V steel, which is holds its edge forever. Um, and then if I'm by myself, I'll throw the Havilon in. If I'm hunting with uh, Lenny, Jason, or Tyler, you know, each so like he'll, Lenny will have his Havilon, and I'll have that Kestrel. So we kind of have a, a knife with some backbone and the Havilon for doing kind of the finer caping. Yeah, and then uh, game bags. Um, kind of, I don't really have anything set in stone. I, I use the Alaskan game bags are great for like a hindquarter of an elk if you're gonna leave the bone in because they they basically stretch around and work perfectly. Um, Jason's been using those tag bags, and I've bummed a couple from him last year, and they're they're super nice. They're especially if you're gonna well, they're super nice if you bone out because they have they're a static shape you know so as you put the meat in there it's going to form into this nice tube that really packs into the back of a a, on the load shelf of an xo really really well um so and then uh gosh lenny what's that other big game bag we used last year (laughs) i can't remember the name of it oh go gear Goat gear, that's right. Goat oh, gear game okay. bags. Yeah, they're they're a little bit heavier. They're like six, seven ounces for a game bag, but they have a little bit of stretch, a bomb proof mesh material. Yeah, they're tough. Um they're really, really tough bags. I, I actually packed out my mountain goat with it last year. Um and uh I, I was super, super impressed with those. So I think I've got all of those game bags sitting in my closet here and I'll probably grab a you know combination of them here when it comes time to go hunt deer. Yeah. Yeah, I'm using the tag bags. Uh I really really like them. Um I think yeah. I have that kit that they sell. It's uh I think they call it the bomb pack or whatever uh for mm-hmm. boned out meat bags. Um and like you said, they hold the shape and then they're kind of like tall and narrow. And so as you're dumping that meat in there, you're not getting like one giant, you know, like blob that just wants to fall down and uh like you said it helps you, you know, get it in that load shelf. It helps you get that boned out meat, uh, you know, vertical, more like it is a quarter and is not sagging too much. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, it's a little bit investment up front, but in just in terms of being reusable, I mean, you know, just wash them and they're good to go. Nice. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mine's about the same as Steve's, uh, but I'm actually not using a have one anymore. I'm using the Outdoors Edge um, oh, just because c- I... Pr- the replaceable one, though? Their new one? Yep. Yep, yeah. the replaceable one. And But the only reason I changed is that just that I broke too many blades with that Havilon, and it's so sharp that it it kind of freaks me out, honestly, yeah. in the backcountry. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. just like, man, if I cut myself, this is going to be bad. Um, so the outdoors edge, the blade is definitely not as sharp. Uh, it doesn't hold its edge as long, but it's just it's thicker and a little sturdier, and I've never broke one, so I just kind of took that trade off. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I use the Havilon. Um, it scares the crap out of me. I mean, that's good. <laughs> they're so freaking sharp. Um, they are. And this is coming from somebody who, like, almost sliced his finger off during a hunt and had to go to the hospital. So I'm extra scared <laughs> of the Havilon. Um, <laughs> man, they're freaking, they just work so well, though. Like, I mean, they yeah, do. if you get the pry and you're going to break them for sure. But, you know, I, you know, it comes with 12, 12 blades and you'll probably go through, you know, maybe four on an elk. Um, right has been our and, experience and they came out with a thicker blade what, last year or something like yeah. that it's like a little shorter stubbier one or uh-huh. it's been a couple of years now and I, don't, I actually haven't used that one i've i've heard people have better results with it but yeah yeah and same that, I, same as Lenny on cutting art like i've cut my hand twice and jason cut his hand on uh my buck in wyoming last year and they just that thing's so damn sharp that you you bleed forever um 
and I'm actually a big baby when it comes to my own blood and have to like sit there for 30 minutes, you know, like about ready to pass out. I don't know why it happens, but so that's, that's one reason I, I like packing that Kestrel sharp enough to get the job done, no doubt. And, and I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Actually, we just got an email to the podcast, uh, email, um, uh, podcast at Exo Mountain Gear. So email us, but from Ashley and he was just, uh, saying that Havilon just came out with a new knife. Um, and sent us the link to it. It's actually really cool. So it's, um, like their Jim Shockey signature series or whatever, but it has the typical, um, fold out Havilon replaceable blade. Um, but then it has another fixed, uh, by fixed, I mean, non-replaceable, um, has another blade that folds out. That's your standard, you know, um, oh, with yeah. and reinforced blade. So it looks like it could be a cool option. Yeah, kind of have the best of both worlds. Yeah, for 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 skinning, you could use the the sharp one, and kind of for the other stuff, you use the bigger one. Hmm, Good idea. Yeah, so it's a um, uh, yeah. I tried to look at the site, and I didn't see the weight on the full package. But yeah, it kind of has your standard pocket knife, drop point blade, and then the replaceable have on. So thanks, Ashley, for the heads up on that. Yeah, yeah, that's that'd be a good product. Cool. Um, well, moving on, um, optics, uh, spine scope, binoculars, tripod. Uh, what are you guys rocking? I am in transition right now. Historic, you know, before I rocked the Nikon ED50, use that forever. Awesome scope. And then I kind of upgraded to the Razer 65 HD. Um, and now I'm kind of in between. I'm thinking about going back to lightweight. Um, so not totally sure there, but both those have been awesome, kind of depending on what I'm doing for Mule Deer, the Razor for Elk, the Nikon ED50. And then um, I'm using, actually you're going to help me here, Steve. What am I using, a Slick? Yep, Slick 634. Yeah, 634. Um, awesome, carbon. Um, what's great about it is is I, I, I pack um, an Allen wrench set anyways for my bow, and it's real quick. Just pop that off. You pull the leg off and use that either for a trekking pole or for uh, the tent in my uh, go light tent. So that's kind of what I got. That's pretty nice. cool. And your binos? Uh, the Vortex uh, HD. Uh, I can't remember what they are now. Razor, yeah. <laughs> Razor, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I, uh, you know, not hunting muleys yet, not, you know, sitting and glassing like that and typically where we hunt for elk it's fairly thick so i Mm -hmm. haven't been run a spotter you know i've used them uh for other things but typically don't pack one um and then binos i've kind of jumped all over from you know vortex to minoc uh minoc last year i tech uh tested some from hawk and they're actually pretty impressive i think it was their sapphire eds um Mm -hmm. so it was actually really good glass for the price um so yeah, I'm just kind of all over, uh, always checking something out. Nice. Uh, for me, binoculars, Swarovski SLC 10 by 42. Um, I, part of the perk of being a dealer for like, you know, through S and S through for Swaro and Leica and Zeiss and Vortex, I get a chance to spend a lot of time, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take two or three, four pairs out with us and do head to head reviews. And, um, after, pretty extensive testing last year i settled on the slcs for myself a uh, combination of price weight uh optical quality um size in my hand they they, they feel the best i kind of that it's my opinion that's the, probably the best binocular on the market right now um just i i can't say enough good things about that slc so um spotting scope i'm a little all over the place right now um I, I actually had a customer buy a Swarovski 95 ATX. That thing's like probably heavier than my freaking whole pack and tent and <laughs> bag and everything combined. But uh, I ordered it in from Swaro and then I canceled. And I, I was like, well, heck, I'm going to go take take this thing out. And I, I was blown away by that thing. I mean, uh, it's it's almost worth like me packing the eyepiece and Lenny packing the objective <laughs> piece since because you can split that in half really easy and Just holy crap, for miles huh yeah literally I, I took it out scouting last weekend for elk and 
I was sitting on a peak and I'm filming a buck at a mile and a half. Um, I, I found this buck and then I filmed a, filmed a lot of elk and it, it's a 30 to 70. It's just pretty impressive. But um, I have a Nikon ED50 like Lenny does. I love that from an ultralight perspective. The Vortex Razor 50 is really good scope as well. Um, there's, there's, I don't know. I have not found the perfect spine scope yet. There, there's just so much give and take of price quality you know weight is always so much in the forefront of my mind that um that i have a tough time packing a heavy like even the swaro atx is 58 ounces which is uh they're 65 which is more than my tent bag and pad combined you know that's, <laughs> that's just a lot of weight yeah. and, I, and i'm not a big you know uh jason and would argue probably with Lenny and I on this, but if for Lenny and I, if we see something and go, yep, it's got a good frame, we're going to go kill it. You know, Jason wants to pick that thing apart and, and see if he's 160 or 175 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so not a big, big spotting scope guy. So uh, if I'm hunting that, that, the 50 millimeter scopes, I tend to lean towards those from a weight savings perspective. Um, and then, like you said, Mark, elk, elk country, not that important. Deer country, it can be really important. So yeah. Um, and then tripod, I run that ProMaster uh, XC525C, awesome carbon fiber tripod, two pounds only for the legs. And then uh, I have a Vanguard PH111V head that I run on it. It's a really good lightweight, kind of frankly budget head. It's only 69 bucks, and the performance that you get out of it well exceeds the price you pay for it. So it's a great combination. I've been running that for uh, – this will be the third season with that set up. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, man, we're cruising right along here. Uh, yeah. The um, clothes, uh, unfortunately, are probably all going to be very similar here. Uh, definitely most of us are fans of First Light and what they're doing. Um, so how about you, Lenny? What are you going to be running First Light-wise? Um, I'll run, I mean, the Chama hoodie is probably my favorite piece of gear um, from those guys. It's just so versatile, but um and then i'm going to use their new pants which are what are those called again uh corrugate yeah i'm going to wear the their new corrugates um i think kind of for how i hunt and how rough i am on stuff i think that'll be a good fit for me um use their beanie uh hat and then i i, I just use like army wool surplus gloves i've had them forever um and then i'll use their uh their puffy jacket um kind of for my uh pillow slash use it all the time every day yeah yep yeah that thing's pretty invaluable the yeah the yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 it, it is i mean it just through every weather condition i mean it's it's amazing the range of temperatures i can wear that in yeah 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 i'm pretty similar i mean it's it's pretty much a requirement to have their lightweight and midweight top for you know, the way we hunt and where we hunt. I mean, that's pretty much what I live in 90% of the time for sure. 95% of the time. But then when you need that puffy, um, it's pretty invaluable. Um, yeah, I've been testing the Corgit as well. Um, have been using the Canabs for a few years. Um, I like the changes they made to the Canabs this year for sure. I think it's, um, going to help. Um, the Corgits I do like, um, I'm, kind of a little bit freakishly tall and so they're a bit short on me which kind of bugs me <laughs> um although i will say the lifesaver is their new gators um so as long as i'm running the gators with the corgits it's not too big of an issue but if i wouldn't if i didn't have the gators the corgits are just a bit too short but you know i'm six three so i'm somewhat used to that so yeah i don't know if i'm going to take the corgits um or the canabs and to be honest with you i think i might run them both um my my buddy's actually packing the tent in this year so i'm like hey i'm i'm running pretty light so there's a few things that i might just double up on just for the heck of it just to see how it performs and and test them out but they're both both great nice um yeah so for me uh corrugate pants i've been i ran um actually a, a, a kind of an rei hippie company called prana they make a pant called the Stretch Zion, and I actually used that all last year, and it's basically the exact same, and then it's a 100% nylon four-way stretch pant. Um, and then when the Corrugate came out, I was really excited about that from First Light because it's I was running nylon pant last year and, and absolutely loved it from 
a durability perspective, and it seemed to do a good job, whether it was hot or cold. So definitely running the corrugates this year. I've been testing them out here for the last couple months and really happy with them. Lano QZ for my base layer. Love that quarter zip. You know, open it up on those hot deer hunts. And, you know, man, you can't say enough good things about that that kind of lightweight merino wool. It's, it's more comfortable than a cotton t-shirt. Chama hoodie for sure. Like Lenny said, it, it and the Uncompagri Puffy are my two favorite first light pieces by far. I just, the versatility of those, I, I can't say enough good things about them. That puffy jackets, my insulation layer, and, then, and we, so we wear it off and on all day long. You know, you wear it in the morning, you get hiking, you take it off, sit down to drink some coffee at 10 a.m., put it back on, sit down to glass, you know, afternoon, evening when, the, you know, the winds start picking up and the sun starts setting, and I, I love that jacket. Um, Not to be a commercial here, but that's one thing I freaking love about that stretch pocket on the XO is just stuffing in those layers like that. Because you don't have to zip anything <laughs> open. You don't have to do jack. You just yeah. throw it in there <laughs> yeah. and pull it out. Yeah, it's a, a lot of that layout's all about that efficiency of not having to do undo like 15 compression straps to get to something. So yeah. the stretchy pocket's great for that. But uh, um trying to think what else. I don't run a beanie. I just wear a, we just have these mesh trucker hats that we sell. I wear that. And then I, between my Chama hoodie and the puffy jacket, that covers my head. Um, I do run some rag wool gloves. Just like they're, I buy them. I have like 10 pairs of these things. I buy them from Sportsman's Warehouse, and they cost like 10 bucks. And they're my favorite glove I've ever worn. Um, I have one with like some insulation in it and then other pairs that are uh, just, just the rag wool. And I can't say enough for a cheap, effective thing. They, they work amazing. Yeah. Um, and... Socks. I have I have some first light socks. I've got some smart wool socks. I've got I've got a bunch of different socks. I, I really don't have a favorite. They all they all seem to work great for me and work. Yeah. Um, you know, you, keep me blister free. So, do you guys run the first light boxers at all? Oh <laughs> yeah, I can't believe we skipped past that. Yeah, red deserts. Yeah, those suckers are a monkey butt saver. <laughs> oh dude, I'm saying <laughs> uh, they definitely they are. I can't say enough good things about those. I try to hundred different pairs of boxers and once i started using the red deserts man i've never looked back yeah and i don't know like you know there's only so much you can do really to control scent on an extended hunt but man probably one of the best things you can do to help control scent is not wear freaking synthetic underwear because that stuff's just no matter what oh, you yeah. do it's no, nasty it's in a day rain, you know so, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. so god those freaking red deserts are a lifesaver i agree yeah absolutely so that pretty much covers it. Gloves, beanie. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I'm pretty much running everything first light and, and I just love their stuff. They're a great Idaho company here and, um, love supporting them. Cool. Well, that was a good discussion guys. Let's, uh, let's wrap up with a couple things here. Let's make some recommendations on what you guys think are good pieces of gear, you know, for those guys who are maybe getting into back, backpack hunting, really want to be weight conscious at the same time, what are maybe some recommendations for good budget items? And then let's wrap up with uh, our total pack weights. So any recommendations on good ways to cut weight, those big items, or uh, good budget alternatives? Yeah, for me, my my general rule and experience with talking to a lot of guys is, is number one, packing too much stuff. Um, if you want to cut weight, stop packing so much extra things, you know? Um, and that's the cheapest, easiest thing to do. Uh, and that's probably the first mistake beginner backpackers make is that inexperience and, and doubt of not knowing what you need or don't need. You, you just pack more to be on the safe side. And, you know, that's, that's smart, but at the same time, that extra 10, 15 pounds over five days and, you know, some 20, 30, 40 miles, however far you're hiking and all that time, it really adds on you. So getting your gear list whittled down to the bare essentials of what you're going to need back there is, is huge. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of good, um, a pack is, you know, that's on the more expensive side of, you know, there's some stuff that's out there that's going to be seven, eight pounds and you jump into, uh, you know, like an XO that's going to be the four or five pound range. You can save three pounds there. Um, sleeping bags, you know, th- that's going to be another expensive thing to, you know, to go from a three pound bag to a, a pound and a half bag costs you a lot of money, unfortunately. Um, 
you know, I, I think going back to packing too much stuff, people pack way too much clothes, you know, you're, you're going to be fine with one pair of pants, one pair of boxers, you know, if you got some good boxers, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you don't, you don't need to have an extra pair of pants and a full rain gear kit if there's no rain in the forecast, stuff like that. So I, my general suggestion, I guess, just keeps going back to just get down to the bare essentials of what you need to pack and don't have doubles and extra of everything. Instead, do the opposite. Find things that, you know, like our puffy jacket that's our pillow and our insulation layer, um, that, that things that have double, double and sometimes triple use. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, definitely when you get at home, look at your pack. If there's anything in there that you did not use, do not take it again. I mean, for the most part, unless it's a first aid type type deal. Yeah. yeah. Any suggestions out yeah. there, Lenny, that you know of, of things that you could save money on, you know, and still go lightweight? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I, you could save the most weight, I think, the quickest with the pack. I mean, because you can drop a couple of pounds right there. You know, if you go from a nine pound pack to a four or five pound pack, I think that's, you know, pound, dollar for dollar. I, I, I still think that's probably the, the cheapest way to, to drop weight. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then after that, you just kind of start looking at your big items, um, you know, your bag, your tent. Um, and, and, and like you said, we look at the forecast before we go. I mean, I mean, obviously in the high country, it's unpredictable, but for the most part, you know, unpredictability is kind of smaller storms, but you can wait out and you can, you know, make work with your gear, but we really look and see, Hey, what's going to happen. And then that, that determines, you know, what tin are we going to take? We're taking, you know, the bomb proof one or we, are we going with no floor? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think just be smart about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing, you know, getting to the other topic with budget too, because, Obviously, it's just so hard, especially as guys look to go lightweight to, you know, to get on a budget. And there becomes a point where it just isn't worth it. You know, you're spending X amount of dollars to save, you know, a few ounces. And it does get crazy. But, you know, look, a couple things. Look for gear that isn't necessarily hunting specific, but that is built really well. (laughs) Um, And then you can find deals on. I mean, there's so many places to find deals on good gear, whether that's mountaineering gear or just, you know, things you know marketed to the outdoor crowd in general that's not hunting specific not everything has to be hunting specific so you know hit that freaking rei garage sale or the off season um you know times and look for deals there and then the other thing is just don't necessarily be afraid to look used you know whether that's on a hunting forum um or just from somebody you know i mean that's man when i like got started almost everything i bought was used um, Steve, you've probably forgotten this, but I like bought a tent off of Steve. I bought yeah, Steve's old rangefinder. Actually, St- Steve, I'm still using your old rangefinder. Are you serious? Um, <laughs> oh yeah, man. I'm rocking that Nikon, the 550. Oh nice. yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah, I mean, two things in, in terms of saving money, uh, you know, shop good general outdoor gear it's not necessarily hunting specific and then you know be willing to to look used any other tips on on that you know when, when lenny was talking there about uh weather and stuff like that it just hit it reminded me of uh, another thing that we do when i picked this up from lenny is lenny has this tote um you know i don't know what the dimensions are what 16 by 18 by 20 or something just a plastic tote you'd buy at walmart or whatever and inside that tote is basically all of his gear for just kind of all of your hunting gear. And we always take that with us. So we've got our pack and our tote and our bow, and that's what gets loaded in the truck. And we're checking like in that tote is my rain gear at all times and extra fuel canisters and extra food. And um, so I'm not necessarily packing at the house. I get kind of 90%. And then like literally as we're driving up there, we're checking the weather and and we're deciding our hunting plan sometimes and then we load our pack right there last minute for that specific trip um that kind of goes back to the weather of like all right you know or, or maybe in my tote i've got the lightweight tent and his tote he's got the heavier tent and we make yep. a last minute decision on which one we're going to take with us so uh just kind of a cool thing like i said i picked up from lenny that you just it's kind of like your survival tote you yeah. in that need in that it's with you in the rig um, and if you're hunting, if when you're hunting, your your plans change or nasty weather comes in, you can always hike back out and you got that tote there with some, you know, I'll have extra clothes in it or stuff like that. Just kind of um, just a bunch of extra of everything. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's great. Cool. Well, one one final thing. Let's wrap up kind of uh, talking about where you can get these gear lists and then maybe what our total pack weights are. So, um, mm-hmm. Steve, your 2015 gear list is up at the Pure Elevation blog. So that's pure-elevation.com. Uh, yep. Lenny's, we'll get yours up uh, this week. So um, by the time this podcast is there and Steve and Lenny, uh, their gear list will be up there. Um, mine's, uh, at my site, souladventure.com. If you go to like souladventure.com forward slash elk, uh, that's probably the easiest way. I know that there's a link to my gear list there. So, um, Steve, you're going to be the lightest for show. What is, uh, <laughs> your typical pack way? Yeah. So if, right there on pure elevation, when I, I built my gear list, I, I literally had my, I have this little scale that weighs to the gram and I weighed everything out. Um, so my total base weight for basically everything we talked about today is 16.3 pounds, which is crazy, crazy light. And that what that does not include is water uh, and food. Uh, so food is roughly a pound and a quarter to a pound and a half per day, depending on um, what I feel like packing. You know, if it's going to be a long trip, I'll I'll get down to that pound and a quarter. If it's like a short three day trip, I'll just pack some extra stuff just to kind of gorge myself when i feel like it so so 16.3 pounds and you know uh say i got a little bit of water and um you know four days of food in there i'd be like 23 24 pounds hiking in um and the only addition to that would be my bow strapped on um onto the pack which you know that's five six pounds yeah and does that count your spotting scope yep that is my spotting scope that nice that's freaking ridiculous yeah it is so for you mere mortals out there um lenny what's a more realistic pack weight <laughs> <laughs> you know i i always think i'm pretty light but i'm at 22 pounds just like my base weight so i'm five six pounds heavier than him just out the door before my food and i carry a lot more food than him so by the end of it i'm like 10 pounds heavier yeah 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 i mean i'm um i'm like you know we pretty much are going out for a week most times and my base weight no food no water is uh 24 and change and then you know I'll, it, again for a six seven day trip i'll probably have about 10 pounds of food um so by the time you know i strap a bow on and add food my 24 pounds you know turns into 40 um yeah. with all the above mm-hmm. so yeah yeah and i said so we got five liters of water and a bow strapped to the pack you know you're you get up there pretty quick it, it starts stacking on but that you know, water's that thing that just kind of comes and goes, so you really can't count it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Steve and I, like, over the years, we've definitely found there's, like, a, there's, there's for us, I think there's, like, a breaking point in what your pack weighs to where it's, uh, where it feels like you could wear it all day. And I think for us, we found, like, that's in, like, the upper 30s. Is that what you'd say, Steve? <laughs> yeah. Steve was thinking yeah. upper teens. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> off the record... We yeah, I mean, mid the, mid thirties maybe. Um, it's like if you can keep your pack there, like it kind of doesn't matter. You can wear it all day. You you don't get fatigued. Um, and yeah. and and it's weird. It's like if you, if you have a five five pound swing, you get up into forties, and you know after three four days in the backcountry, it, it, it you really start feeling it. So yeah. if there's any way to keep it down there at that weight. It seems like it's it's yeah. key. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. I mean, I just I think. A lot of it just goes back to every pound just adds up, you know, over four or five days, you know, every pound you can save is that much less energy you've expended and that much harder and longer you can hunt. So that that's kind of always been my motivation that I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of comfort or maybe I sleep a little bit colder than Lenny does because I don't pack a 15 degree bag. But to me, that all adds up because on day five, six, seven I'm still going strong, um, and that, I guess that's my main motivation to to get as light as I possibly can. Yeah, cool. Well, that was a great discussion, guys. Uh, once again, all these gear lists you can either find on pure-elevation.com or souladventure.com. Uh, there's links to a bunch of those products as well. And as always, any questions, just go ahead and email us podcast at exomountaingear.com. Thank you for listening to the Hunt Back Country Podcast. <laughs>